Hey, Jennifer. Hi, good morning, Charles. How are you? I'm doing all right. How are you? I'm great. We are in this beautiful, gorgeous office. Wow. Very um, nice. <laughs> that belongs to Lisa Brummel, who is the Vice President of um, Human Resources at Microsoft. Hi. Excellent. Hello. So, Lisa, tell us a little bit about your job. What does it mean to be VP of HR? So, there's, there's two things that really I'm responsible for. One is the people of the company and making them happy and figuring out what's going on and creating an environment that peop where people want to come to work every day. And the other is working with Steve and the executive team to really set a structure in place that helps the company strategy move forward as it relates to the people in the company. So if I were to separate my job into two ways, it would be one, working for Steve and the executive team, and two, really thinking about the entire population of the company that is, in micro that is Microsoft, worldwide, 63,000 people, the whole thing. So you're, you're relatively new to the position, right? Like Six months. Six months. And were you in a product group? I was. For the first 16 years of my career here, I was in a product group. I started out in the marketing pipe. Um, I was a college hire, so I came from business school at UCLA and joined as a product manager in a group called Multimedia Publishing. And my job was to go out and find third-party developers who were writing consumer applications on the Macintosh who might be interested in porting it to this new operating system called Windows 3.0. Um, and that's how I started, and I spent the first five or six years of my time here really doing different marketing functions in the developer division, in Office, on the Mac business. Um, and then about six years in, I started to do what we'd call multifunctional management, so managing all kinds of people, testers, program managers. And I moved back into the consumer space, and really from, you know, my sixth year to my sixteenth year, I was in the consumer space in the company managing various businesses in the home and retail division. Everything from consumer software to our hardware business, keyboards, mice, um, to our retail operations group. At one point I had retail sales. So really a variety of different experiences here. Um, after about year two, they all involve some form of management. Hmm. And so um, you, told, you told the story, I think, at the company meeting where you said that Steve rolled up one day and said, Lisa? <laughs> <laughs> he did. I was minding my own business, just doing my job. Um, about, uh, I, was, I went on vacation, and um, the Sunday night prior to the Monday when I was going to return to work, I checked my schedule, and I noticed there was a one-on-one -on -one with Steve, which is um, unusual, not wildly unusual, but we had just met about three weeks before, so I couldn't quite understand. Um, and it was supposed to be on a Thursday. On a Wednesday night, the phone rang, and Steve said, "Hey, I'd like to talk to you uh, today instead of tomorrow. And you know, can we do it?" And I said, "Sure. My meetings end at this time. How about if I come to your office?" And he said, "No. How about if I come to yours?" So I said, "Do you even know where my office is?" He said, "No, but I'll find it." <laughs> so um, it's true. He got in his car and drove to my office, um, showed up, and said, "Hey, we'd like you to run HR for the company." And um, I was surprised. It hadn't been uh, one of the things on my career objectives. Not that I was um, against doing something like that. I had just never thought about it. Mm -hmm. And Steve felt that based on my management experience in the company and my interest in the people that who worked with me, um, that I might be a good candidate to come do this job, to care about all the people of the company. And we had a fairly lengthy discussion about it and a little bit of a back and forth. And in the end, I said, you know, it probably does make sense for me to come do this. And um, pretty much the next day, I started the job. Is it possible wow. to say no to Steve Ballmer? <clears throat> I tried three times, and he didn't accept any of them. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> in, in a good way. In a good way. He, he, Convincing. In a in a very good and convincing way. I mean, he he truly felt he saw something that perhaps I didn't even see uh, in myself, and I, you have to respect that for someone who's really thought through um, what he believes someone's skills are and what he thinks needs to happen in the job. So the no was a good no, um, and actually a really reinforcing no for me. Uh, but it was in fact a no. <laughs> so. So um, people, not just at Microsoft, but people, um, you know, in all industries, have different ideas of what HR means and, mm -hmm. and what does that human resources include. What does it mean for you? And what were the big surprises when you came to the job? Um, what it really means is creating an environment where people can do their best work. That's the simplest way to talk about it. And there are different components to that. Um, one is just a systems component. The, the system of administering pay, administering feedback, managing performance, it's you know operationalizing that for 63,000 people around the world um, is, 
you know, a task onto itself. The second thing is communicating with employees and being communicated back. Mm -hmm. You know, what's happening in the company? What, what makes you excited about staying here? Where are the areas where you feel we're not living up to the promise that we've made to you? How do we go about changing those things? So there's the broad systems part of it. There's the dialogue with employees part of it. And then there's how do we support the, the business agenda of the company? Where does the company want to go? What types of people do we need to have in place? What should the structure of our organizations be? If we want to push innovation, are we set up correctly to do that? Do we have the right types of people leading the efforts? So that's really what we think about. There's sort of the day-to-day -day systems part, and there's already all the way through to the forward thinking, you know, what does the company want to do five to ten years from now, and do we have the right people and structure to get that done? Mm -hmm. So what do you love about your job? I love being with people in the company. That is my most favorite thing. Much as I love this office and much as I love working with Steve, uh, my favorite thing is just to get out and talk to people uh, in the company. I've just started a segment called Listening Sessions, mm -hmm. and I do them once a week um, in the morning. I find a room around campus that holds at least 100 people, and we invite everybody in the adjacent buildings to come and talk about the issues of the company. And it is the most invigorating time for me to hear what people have to say and for me to give a dialogue back for how I'm thinking about things mm -hmm. because I think I have an influence on their opinions and they have an influence on mine and I think that's how good HR should be run. Right. Hmm. So um, tell us a little bit about your background. How did you come to Microsoft? <laughs> um, so I'm a sociology major which means I have zero technical background. When I went to school we used punch cards so it's been a while. Um, I spent my first work experience actually doing sales so going around and selling college textbooks. Uh, as part of that, uh, I learned good persuasive skills. <laughs> um, I learned how to talk to people and learned how to listen to people. But I kind of got the computer bug about two years into that, and this was way back when PCs were just starting out, because I was trying to get information together, and I was literally translating with paper and pencil something every week which would take me an entire day to translate and I thought gosh a computer ought to help me with this so I went out and bought my own computer uh, it was an IBM PC with no hard drive it was an 8088 processor and had one of the big floppy disks and I thought I had died and gone to heaven because I had that big floppy disk and I had a dot matrix printer and I had dbase1 and I had multiplan and I had some word processor I couldn't even tell you today and what I did was I said okay Here's this task I have of taking this information and trying to make it useful, and here's this tool. How do I bring the two of them together? And I just taught myself. It was very simple. But what it did was it really got me excited about technology. It got me excited about the promise of technology. So then I thought, okay, I'm sort of a user-taught person with a sociology major. I'm probably not going to be a computer scientist. I don't think I have the aptitude. So going back and trying to get a master's degree in computer science probably won't get me where I want. Mm -hmm. But what if I went back to business school and sort of combine this sort of sales and marketing thing with information systems, which is sort of on a personal level what I was really doing. So I went back to UCLA and got my MBA in marketing and information systems. Mm -hmm. And that was really my step into the technology world. Microsoft happened to recruit on campus. So I interviewed. I interviewed with Microsoft and Tandem and Hewlett Packard, so some of the big ones at the time. And I was super impressed with the Microsoft environment. I was impressed with people's ability to get things done. Mm -hmm. I was impressed with the fact that people cared more about um, solving problems than they did about, you know, really how things worked or having a hierarchy. I thought it was a very free-flowing environment and it really impressed me when I came up here and started to meet the people and I really felt like gosh this is a place I could come and do something meaningful where technology could really be pushed out to a lot of people and others could have the same experience I have of sort of opening up this whole new world when when you get technology and that's what brought me here and I can say in all the time I've been here there hasn't been a day where I haven't come to work and really appreciated what we do. Excellent. And so, um, 16 years is a long time. Yeah. And um, we all have our good days and our bad days, mm -hmm. but you keep coming back because you love it. What do you love the most? I learn something new every day here. That's what I love the most. Mm -hmm. Every job is different, every day of every job is different, every interaction with every person is different, partly because our industry changes so quickly, mm -hmm. partly because our company needs to transform itself 
on a, a, <clears throat> on a time schedule that's very different than many other industries. So there's always change going on. And there's always smart people pushing the envelope. And to me, that's what's exciting about being here. If there's a day when I come to work and say, oh, I didn't learn anything today, that's probably the day that I need to say, okay, I'm, I'm done here. I haven't come to that yet. I'm, I hope I don't come to that in the near future. But that's really the time when I know, okay, I, I'm done here because I've stopped learning. Mm -hmm. So Microsoft recently has really um, been um, expanding their initiative around diversity mm -hmm. and um, being more inclusive. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that from your perspective? Sure. It's incredibly important as a global business that we're diverse. Um, and diversity spans many different areas. There's just global diversity. Making products for people all over the world means you need to have insight from people all over the world and how you do that. Um, there's a great mix of ideas and people and cultures that can come together to make things better. Partly from a customer perspective, hey, we need people who understand the customers who are like this, um, but partly just from a diversity of ideas perspective. And whether it's you know gender diversity or any other form of diversity, having a group of people in a room, in a division, in a company, really thinking from different perspectives about a problem, in my personal perspective, and I believe the perspective of the company, leads us to a better end result. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we strive for. And we need to find every way possible to draw out that pool of people and really offer them the opportunity to drive results in the company. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it's not cookie cutter. It takes all types, and that's good, right? Absolutely. It's essential. It's not just good, it's essential. We will not succeed as a global company in the variety of businesses that we're in, with the variety of customers we have, at the volume that we have those customers, without having a diverse workforce. So can I just say on that note that it's December, and it's pretty cold in Seattle, but you're wearing shorts. You bet. <laughs> and I think that's your signature like trademark. I saw you wearing shorts like in September at the company meeting. Tell us about that. You know, this is a thing that started uh, probably 10 years ago, 10 or 11 years ago. Um, one day, it was in the summer, and I wore shorts to work. Uh, I don't even quite remember why. Maybe it was just because I felt like wearing shorts to work. And I said, you know, hey, this is a pretty comfortable thing. Why don't I keep doing this? And so it just started because I thought to myself, you know, there's a point here at this company to being who you really want to be. And so it became that trademark, A, because it's just more comfortable for me to wear shorts to work. And then it sort of became a sort of a representative statement for me to help remind people that it really is about you. Mm -hmm. It's really about who you are when you come to work. It's not about what you look like. It's not about anything else. You know, it's about what you contribute to your product group, or to the business, or to a service, or whatever, but it's really about you. So there was just a basic, you know, comfort level <laughs> that was good for me. And then I think it's just been more representative for me to say to people I work with, look, it's just, it's about what we each bring. It's not about anything else. Right. And you've never felt like held back, or people thought, well, that's not very professional, or X, Y, or Z because of that? Um, you stay true to it? I stay true to it, but I'm respectful of it. So um, there are certain cultures when I travel outside the U.S. where it would be inappropriate for me to wear shorts. I think there are certain people who come from a customer perspective, who come into Microsoft to meet with me, external candidates, where I want to be respectful. I want people to understand that we're unique, but I, sometimes it's difficult for me people to make the big leap between wearing a suit every day and shorts and I want them to respect Microsoft and I want them to respect what we do so I am respectful of the people that I meet with externally who may not fully appreciate the culture as we do or who have other cultural cultural norms and I want to be respectful of that but you know other than that no I don't think it's held me back um, you know, career wise no it's who I am it's it is quite a statement, though, um, since, you know, if you really think about it in isolation and you think about the fact that I deal with the executive leadership every single day yeah. and this is how I look every single day, it really does say something about Microsoft. It mm -hmm. says something about our ability to accept people for who they are. And I've always believed that, and I probably pushed the envelope a little bit more than most people. 
Um, but I actually did have one executive. I went through a period where I thought perhaps I should just wear long pants. That would be a, that would be a good thing. I could be more professional. And actually, one of the senior vice presidents who I've known for a long time stopped me and said, "Is there something wrong? You know, are you not feeling well? Is this, you know, are you unhappy?" <laughs> and that's really what he said, are you unhappy? And I said, no, I just thought I should be more professional. And he was like, why? I don't, I don't get it. Interesting. So, you know, that was my test case to say, okay, you really do have to be who you are. Have Steve or Bill ever said anything to you about your shorts? Nope, never. <laughs> never. <laughs> never. Not one way or another. No, because they know, you know, uh, amongst us, this is who we are. Right. Um, and they know that I am incredibly respectful of the environment that I'm placed in to represent the company and that I'll do the right thing as it relates to that, but no. Excellent. So um, we've been interviewing quite a few women for this series mm -hmm. and um, actually a lot of women have named you as the one they look up to and as <laughs> a, a, a mentor because um, you are in the executive ranks at Microsoft and there there could be more females, mm -hmm. um, um, vice presidents and executives. So who do you look up to? Who do you, who, who is a role model for you? Um, I actually have a mixed group of role models, and it depends on what they are. Some of them are men and some of them are women. Certainly a trailblazer at the company was Patty Stonecipher when she was here. I worked for her for a while, um, and prior to that I worked with Susan Boshin. Uh, so those were two leaders who I saw move up through the company uh, as women and do very well. Um, for In terms of just general role models, I actually take aspects of a lot of different leaders in the company. There are some people who are who who truly have a great way of communicating with people, and I sort of take that aspect from them. There are certain people who are very decisive, and I watch how they make decisions. Mm -hmm. There are certain people who understand how to bring a group together in a way that yields a productive result. I'm not sure there's one person that I look up to, but I really do try to look at the attributes particularly of the senior executives that I work with and in this job I get to see all the pluses and all the minuses and really look at what a composite would look like to me someone who's thoughtful someone who's smart someone who's decisive someone who understands a business agenda and a technical agenda um, and someone who can really make things happen and I take little bits from all of them uh, and I try to bring that into who I am So. In your role, you might, you probably have access to a lot of data and a lot of interesting statistics about the company. What are some of the things, in, in a general sense, that you've seen that really surprised you, that you didn't even know, having been a, an employee for a very long time, but not until you saw the stats? you like, that would surprise me about Microsoft. Um, there actually hasn't, from a data perspective, there hasn't been a, a, a tremendous amount that has surprised me. Um, about what I've seen here and maybe it's because I've been around different groups in the company so I'm exposed to lots of subsets of data and you start to look and say well that's what I expected and it looks the same as that one it looks the same as that one it looks the same as that one I think over my time here I mean again I've only been here six months so it's sort of been um, trial by fire as I've sat in the job and I haven't had a chance to really spend a lot of time with the data of the company mm -hmm. and that is something over the next six months that I will do mm -hmm. but thus far I haven't really come across anything that has been a big surprise to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, what's one of your one or two top priorities? Um, top priority is improved communication with employees that's number one. Um, number two is to get the system of our there are actually three. Um, the, the system of HR in the company to be more reliable than it is today. We have about 50 individual systems for 50 individual tasks that we try to roll out to employees and it's very difficult to stitch that together in a consistent way so that every employee has a good experience. And the third thing is as we go into this new sort of innovation model in the company as we've restructured to get into a more services oriented business to really look and see how does HR hook up with the leadership of the company to make sure we put the right people in the right place and we're in line with moving that agenda forward. So your top priority, one of the top priorities is communication, better communication mm -hmm. with employees. What, is that, what, is, what form does that take? Mm -hmm. Well, we're starting with the listening sessions, which I talked about. Mm -hmm. The other thing is um, we're going to try to have some common places where employees can give feedback and get feedback. So I, I don't really know what form, if it'll take a SharePoint, if I'll write a blog, um, if we'll have a website. I don't really know, but there needs to be a better back and forth 
with our employees so people can feel that there's a place where they can send their ideas, they can place where they can send their issues. Today, you know, if I have an issue with my manager, there's a specific method that I can follow through, and I'm confident that that works well. If I, I just want to say, hey, I have an opinion about the way we do performance reviews in the company, there really isn't a place for employees to share how they can make the company better. Mm -hmm. And so my goal is to find a SharePoint or a website or in some way where we can have a dialogue with employees about how we can make this company better. Certainly the poll, which we do every year, is a great step. And we do a lot of work around the information we get back. But sometimes quantitative information and qualitative information produce different results. So I want to make sure that we have both together um, so that we can understand the quantitative result says the following. Is that true in a qualitative perspective as well? And we just haven't had a way for employees to share with us or for us to share back with them. Certain employees do uh, share their ideas out on the internet though. That's right. So I'm sure you've gone to like many Microsoft and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. I have. And uh, do you like do you read that and like like use that as an assessment to a, like a temperature for the company or you just think it's a couple people that are I I read a variety of different blogs from the technical ones to the broader ones. Sure. And um, I'm always interested in the topics people pick for one thing. Sure. Um, the commentary around them, because I've been at the company a while and because I've been at different groups, um, I have a fairly good assessment of what's accurate and what's not accurate. So I don't really look at any specific comment that someone makes and feel the need to go and say, no, you're right or no, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. But it is interesting for me to see what topics people choose to talk about and to see the perspectives that people have. Sometimes they have perspectives that are right on and you know, part of the listening session is to say, here's what we see too, and guess what, we're all in line. And some people have perspectives that are simply uninformed, and there's no other way to really characterize it than, you know, three people probably talked in a hallway and that became fact and all of a sudden it spread out. So sure. you, you don't want to run after every little thing, but it is always interesting for me to see the topics people choose and sort of how they choose to talk about them. And when people choose to um, criticize the company, how they do that, and when people choose to support the company, how they do that. Mm -hmm. What I'd really love, if I were to make a request to all bloggers out there, mm -hmm. try to be productive. I always look at productive comments and I'm more thoughtful about that. Mm -hmm. That's really important. And I can say in the dialogue with executives, people listen much more clearly to feedback that's productive. It can be super critical. That's never an issue. But the extent to which an employee or a group of employees have thought through and said, okay, we understand the circumstance and really here's what we think, mm -hmm. that goes a long, long way. Outstanding. So can you talk about any specific initiatives that are around um, attracting more women to high tech and Microsoft? Yeah, we're, we're trying to do a lot. In the technical field in particular, it's difficult uh, because the pool, the pool of computer science majors is dwindling mm -hmm. and the pool of women within the computer science field is dwindling. So we've, we are starting an initiative to broaden to not just computer science majors, but to other science and math mm -hmm. majors, people who may not have exact mm -hmm. experience, mm -hmm. but people who are very smart, who have an aptitude for technology and who we can move into those areas. And I think that's one um, that's going to be a big help in helping in filling the pool. Um, I spent uh, about an hour on the phone last week with the woman who runs uh, a group at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and we talked a lot about the population, how they draw women to Carnegie Mellon. And she shared with me a number of different tips about broadening the environment, using their alumni as, you know, the feeder pool to bring more people in. And those are principles we've certainly talked about, but I think that's what we want to do going forward to bring women in as well, to really broaden the available pool of people, figure out what we need to do to take them from wherever technical aptitude they are today to what we need them to do here, and then create an environment where that's supported. And I think we, we do a pretty good job of that. Um, but we just don't have enough people and we want to go find more. Right. And what kind of a place is Microsoft for women? I think Microsoft is a good place for women. Um, I think there are a lot of things that we can do 
around making it a better place for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, you can tell by the employee comments they're not always gender specific. There's a lot of things we need to do in this environment. I think it's a good place for women. I think you'll see some changes. I think we're going to experiment with some things around flex time. We're going to experiment with some things about job structure. We're going to experiment with some things around mentoring. We're going to some experiment with some things around sponsoring. And I don't know that there's one thing that I would say today I would do to make this the most phenomenal place for women. I actually think there's a lot of things we need to do. Um, and there's a lot of things that women need to do for themselves as well. Mm -hmm. um, the women at Microsoft uh, Group is a fantastic group for sort of bringing women together and getting issues out on the table. I'd love for that group, and I've worked with them um, for a while. I was executive sponsor before I moved into this job, to really become empowered to help drive the agenda at the company, to be real participants with me mm -hmm. um, in doing that. And I'm sure they will. Um, I've had a good relationship with them. We just haven't sat down and said, okay, here are the steps we're going to take to do that. But I'm looking forward to that. So part of it is the structural aspects of the company. I think we've made good steps and we'll continue to make steps. And part of it is really encouraging women to participate and help us move forward with the agenda. Mm -hmm. And within that, are there a specific, a couple of ex examples that women, um, that come up again and again about women and their experience here? Um, one of the things we need to provide more broadly is development opportunities for women. What is my next step? What skills do I need to get there? I see it happening very deeply in pockets of the company mm -hmm. um, in a great way. It doesn't always happen as consistently across every group. It happens a little bit everywhere, but it should happen a lot everywhere. Mm -hmm. So part of the people review process we do every year is to really highlight where we are on those development plans. Does everybody have a mentor? Do the key people, you know, across all the levels in the company, where are we with um, bringing people in, retaining them for a period of time, and moving them on to their next step. Mm -hmm. So we do have a forum for this. We have some great work in place. We need it to happen more consistently. That's mm -hmm. really what we need to do. Well, Charles, any more questions? I think this has been fantastic. Yeah, thank you Good. so much for taking the time. My can pleasure. I, can, I, can I ask why it was important for you to make the time to do this for us? Um, I think, A, having the opportunity to share my views with folks in the company is always important to me. I enjoy that a lot. Um, talking a little bit about the role of women in the company is important. Um, I think the notion that you guys have pulled together with the Channel 9 effort is really um, something that helps the company, helps all the employees in the company see people in a different light and see a different level of what each individual brings to the company. And to me, this was a great way to go talk about that because I'm sure that my profile will be different than you know every other profile that's up there. And I think that's great. And it sort of goes back to you need a diverse set of people. And I think you've done a great job of pulling together uh, a wide variety of sort of vignettes of what happens in this company. And I think that's important. Do you go to Channel 9? I do. You watch videos? I do. All right. <laughs> Excellent. Cool. Thank you very Thank much you. for your time. Yes, Lisa. my pleasure. Thanks, Take you guys. Care.